so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go backwards a little bit and just tell you what was happening uh, at CMC before I before I arrived. I arrived here in August of 2017, um, but an executive director, and this is what I have shared with the board: um, the role of an executive director is not to come in and have a vision. Uh, and people always think that that's the role of an executive director, but an executive director gets hired by a board, right? So the executive director, they are a realization of the board's vision. And I think that's something that is oftentimes forgotten when you're thinking about, uh, about what an institution is meant to be doing when they're hiring an exe executive director. Again, that person is only a realization of a board has decided this is the direction that we wanna go in. And we'll talk a little bit about that when, um, when we have our conversation. But remember that there is this relationship between the board and the vision that's really important. So here is CMCB when I first arrived. You can uh, hold off. You don't have to do each one. Hold on. Um, CMCB. <laughs> CMCB. Uh, before I arrived here in 2017, CMCB had 100 and at the time, uh, 107 year history of uh, providing robust set of prog programmatic offerings. CMCB was doing music therapy in hospitals uh, and adult day health centers. We had early childhood programming. We had in-school programs being the largest outside provider of arts education in Boston public schools. And we also had these out of school times. The building you're in right now was, were just, was just one part of the work that we were doing outside of, outside of schools. Um, but CMCB was also a, a PWI or a predominantly white institution. And you could really see it really clearly in every level of the organization. Uh, so 21% of board members uh, were people of color. 20% of the staff were BIPOC. 18% of the faculty were BIPOC. 36% of the, sorry, excuse me, staff leadership. And then 36% of all staff were, uh, were BIPOC. And what people used to say to me when I first arrived is, well, we're not a predominantly white institution. Look at our student population. And I said, only PWIs say that. Uh, that is a statement that only comes from a predominantly white institution because they find a sliver of their organization. They would say, well, we're diverse right here, right? And that's a big number, um, but it's not about just what's happening at the student level. It's also about the power dynamics and where are those conversations as it relates to power. This next thing is that group of people who was that organization, they drafted this job description. And I will tell you that the reason that I came here, the reason I was interested in this role was because of the job description, excuse me, position announcement, <laughs> <laughs> the position announcement that they shared. Um, there were some specific things, an experience, oh, <laughs> there's Wyona, Wyona Lynchman McWhite, the person who just joined us, welcome Wyona, I'm gonna put you on blast. Um, she was the lead consultant for ACG when I was hired. So <laughs> Wyona worked with the <laughs> board of directors to, uh, to draft this position description. An experienced team player for whom the ownership of ideas is less important than the result of the collaborative effort. The ED will be an open, confident, and communicative professional who enjoys exploring ideas and is adept at setting priorities. The ED will bring a passion for music education and a well-rounded set of competencies as a motivational leader, effective communicator, problem solver, advocate, and strategist. And to be honest, I shared this with them at the time. If I was trying to write a position announcement for either who I was or who I aspired to be as a leader, it would have been using language like that. Uh, that was the language. Parts of that were who I were, and the other parts were what I aspired to be as a, as a leader. And then the roles, responsibilities, identify and promote innovative programming that challenges the status quo. And I feel like they should have put that in all caps and bold and different font um, because that was language challenges the status quo, which means challenging what is happening right now and pushes the organization to consider choices which may be outside its traditional comfort zone. And I was like, let's go. Like for me, someone saying that, you know what? We want to be challenged and we want to be pushed beyond what is comfortable for us. Like that takes a lot of introspection to be able to name that in the position announcement. And so I was like, I think they might actually be about this life. You know, and I really thought that about CMCB just by reading that. 
and then lead efforts to increase diversity of faculty and staff to reflect the student diversity. And so there were these metrics based things, but then there was also some values based things that were just in the position announcement. And so then I got here and we started talking about the spheres of influence. I think CMCB really thought of itself um, in many ways as a neighborhood community music school. Um, but it was so much more than that. And I really saw that from the moment I got here. Um, you know, things that, you know, everyone has probably seen the spheres of influence, things within our control, within our influence, things are of interest to us beyond our scope and some major societal issue. And I thought that CMCB could have an important role in things that I think, I felt like the things within our control and within our influence, I feel like those circles could have gotten bigger. Uh, and so as a leader, we had to first establish who we were and then move to activating the things that would be in our, in our sphere of influence. And so this was the, uh, the way that I thought about that uh, organizationally. Uh, we started off thinking about how did the organization just become more culturally competent? I walked in as a black man being culturally black. Um, I, and I was very adamant about that because having spent an entire career in classical music as a classical musician who been very much assimilated into the kind of social construct of whiteness, I gave that up. I shed myself of that. And I wanted to, I, I even said to folks at the interview, if all you want is to hire my black face, don't play yourself. You know, I am actually not the one, but if you really want to do some things, if you really want to have this, if you really want to live by the things that are in that job description, that job position announcement, I could be the one. That is for you to decide. But if you're just looking at getting a brown face, you're going to be looking for another executive director in two years. Uh, so don't play yourself. Because uh, I was very happy with, that's not the things you say when you want to get a job, but <laughs> I just want to name that. But I was also very happy doing what I was doing before. Um, I, had, I was a co-founder of an organization. Um, I was, you know, running this amazing multi-million dollar program, like, and I still had my performance career. I just was giving up teaching at the university, but I still had my full performance career at the time. Uh, and so um, this organization was thinking about becoming more culturally competent. And then it's like, okay, well, let's think about being culturally competent. We've got to do something. We have to have diverse and inclusive actions. We have to do things. And then we have to like change the way that we see what's happening around us so that we can have a better impact on the arts community at large. Moving on to thinking about how are we thinking about just the, not just from the arts community, but how are we thinking about social justice from the perspective of all of Boston? And then how are we thinking about greater Boston? And then how are we thinking about this from a national perspective as well? So it's just kind of moving out uh, of where we were, but being very cognizant when we were here we were just learning that black people existed, right? Which is, you know, and learning how to be around black people, which is where you're becoming more culturally competent. But then you're like, that is in service of this one as an institution. And so we're not just trying to get here, you know, trying to find the least common denominator. One of the things that we talked about was if you, anyone ever seen the matrix of oppression? This became a kind of a standard, well, everyone who's been part of CMCB has seen it. <laughs> it's a standard onboarding document for board members and also for staff members as well. We talk about the whole concept of perspective and how it plays itself out in the ways in which we interact with things. So if we took this and each one of you were to get a copy, if you circled who you were, each of you would be very different. Uh, and so as an institution, when we're thinking about who's coming in and who has power, we really thought about it very much of you know, from this perspective, like who are the folks who, uh, so it wasn't just, you know, how do we get more black people? How do we get more Asian people? But it's really thinking more broadly about who are the people in our institution who have power? Uh, and like, where does the power lie in our institution? And that led us to then drafting this equity and inclusion statement. You were the uh, chair of the DEI committee when we drafted it. Um, I'll read it really fast just for the sake of time. CNCB welcomes, includes, and values all voices, which is the actual name of our capital campaign. Um, these voices will continue to include those from different races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, genders, abilities, faiths, nationalities, ages, and socioeconomic statuses. It was important to us to actually name the perspectives that we valued and, the name, and to name them rather than saying, you know, people who were kind of, you know, different than cisgender white males, right? Which is basically the kind of broad language that is typically used uh, in a statement like this one. 
And then we commit to program offerings reflective of the interests of our various communities, which would then require us to listen. Curricula that support the neurodiversity of our community, recognizing that people aren't all the same. They don't process these works the same. Resources invested equitably among different partnerships reflect the diversity of our communities. And the word equitably was the key word there. Um, so when we're thinking about the, um, the work that we're doing outside of the South End, and think about the work that we might be doing at a school in Dorchester, thinking about the resources that we invest in the South End and the resources that we invest in the school and making sure that they're equitably, uh, that they're equitably invested. Expanded access to music learning and enrichment within and across greater Boston neighborhoods. That's our gig, So that would, but we wanted to make sure we named it as a value. Assembling, creating, recruiting from a diverse slate of candidates for staff, faculty, corporation, and board member positions. Uh, ongoing community conversations to inform our priorities. That's what you are all part of right now. Provide for the related evolving educational needs of our communities. We wanted to think about how were we an agile institution. So as our community continued to change that we felt duty bound to move as our community moved. Creating physical spaces that welcome, include, and ensure safety for all. Uh, we have con we're constantly thinking about how we're becoming more physically access accessible, which we currently aren't fully. And so, anyone who called us out, which you could comfortably do, we would accept it. Um, so, wouldn't feel the need to call us in. You could actually call us out as an organization that is not physically accessible. Uh, implement feedback me mechanisms which drive continuous improvement. Um, and employment and teaching practices that minimize the impact of implicit bias. That was one we spent some time on because everyone is biased. That's an easy thing to just name. Everyone has it, right? That is how we are built, as, you know, especially um, in this country, and I would say in most countries. The question is, what is the impact of, of an individual's bias, right? So you're trying to minimize the impact. Yes, you may not like certain types of people. You may feel uncomfortable around certain types of people. That's your business. Make sure that your bias doesn't impact those folks when they're around you, right? And so it's, again, it's minimizing the impact of your bias. We went through a logo and I, have to, I wanted to put this up here because we changed parts of our own identity. In the place I was thinking about identity, we had to really walk in the shoes of thinking about identity. Our original, um, our original logo was a treble clef. Now a treble clef is a, uh, is, a, is a musical notation that specifically speaks to Western European art music. Uh, when you see other cultures using a treble clef, it's because they're trying to translate their music into Western European artistic language. Uh, the majority of the world's music is um, passed down through an oral tradition. It's not written down. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that as we were thinking about our identity, that we were actually honoring all the various world traditions that exist, uh, that exist in our community. So these three lines here, they represent sound. Um, and we wanted to have something from the Western European artistic tradition. So this is a tie. Uh, for those of you who are music, musicians, you know what that is. And we liked where it's placed because we are, it's Community Music Center of Boston. We are tying music to Boston through our center. Uh, and so that is the meaning. If you've ever seen the FedEx photo, FedEx logo, it's got an arrow in it, which I didn't know until about four years ago. Uh, but in the middle of the FedEx logo, there's an arrow, which I'm like, oh, that makes sense. And these are all the ways in which our identity shows up in our community. That then, as we move through our identity, allowed us to be able to think about our, uh, our strategic plan, which we started the process, what was it, 2019? Yeah, yeah, 2019. Um, and we ratified that strategic plan in the, at the beginning of 2000, uh, the beginning of 2020. And so it, it, we started to evolve as an institution uh, in the ways in which we think about what the work that we're doing. What I really enjoyed about that process was if I had written a strategic plan for CMCB myself, it wouldn't have looked like the one we wrote. Um, it was very much driven by other people. I had a sense of the direction that we might be going in, but the plan itself, actually, it wasn't one that I wrote, which made me even happier because an institution is supposed to own a strategy, not an individual. Uh, and so when we created this, I thought it was a really great way of creating it. So CMCB supports children, young people, and adults to engage in equitable, culturally inclusive, and learner-centered music education programs. 
These programs are intended to foster the following outcomes for particip participants and communities with which we partner. It's a mouthful. Uh, but the plan was to deepen engagement with music through knowledge, skills, and artistry. We kind of started to, as an institution, uh, think about um, uh, whether or not we were trying to train the next generation of classical music performers on stages, which is what the majority of community music schools, what they tend to do. Everyone, you know, is doing Suzuki. You know, everyone is playing the, kind of the Western European uh, master works on the piano. And that's the frame of it. But we started thinking about, well, how are we thinking about this a little bit differently? Uh, that second one, increase access to equitable, culturally inclusive, and learner-centered music education. So learner-centered for us, we started thinking about the young people, and rather than viewing them as an empty vessel who had nothing to offer, and they had a master teacher who filled up this empty vessel with knowledge, we started thinking about what would it look like if that was a human who had a lot to offer us, and we had something to learn from that human. And there was another human in the room who had something that they wanted to teach and learn. And so creating this bi-directional relationship between a young person. Like, what does that do? How does that change the dynamic of what's being taught? Contributing to social emotional development and social connections. Absolutely. That same bi-directional relationship does that. Increase wellness and well-being. Develop skill sets for those learners interested in pursuing performance and non-performance-based music careers. That was a big one for us. Uh, many of you met one of our youth employees, uh, Ashley, when you came in. Uh, Ashley is, a, is part of our youth employment program that we have here. And that program gives young people, we had this, you know, before I say that, we had this wonderful program that was specifically for folks who were looking at majoring in music at colleges and conservatory called our ISP program. Um, and it was, it was great, it was a beautiful program but we didn't actually have anything for people who didn't want to do that, but wanted to be engaged in the arts, who wanted to be engaged in music learning, but with a different outcome. So we kind of had a single outcome that we were focused on, and then there was other outcomes that we institutionally kind of ignored. And so the youth employment program we have now, um, those folks are working, Ashley's working in advancement. So she's working in fundraising. She's, um, you know, we have youth employees who are working in program design. We have a young person who's on our strategic plan advisory committee, and he's a very valuable member of that committee in particular. So we've started to um, rethink to what end is someone engaging in an artistic practice. And I'm going to zip through these really fast just for the sake of time because you don't want to hear me talk too much. Um, but these are the goals of our strategic plan. I'll go through a few of them. Uh, the evolution of our programs, so they're equitable, culturally inclusive, and learner-centered. Um, it was really the second one that we spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, our faculty, um, as we went through and started to explain where we were going, what we were doing, our faculty were like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I totally get it. Oh my gosh, that makes sense. Oh, I'm totally in this with you. Let's go. Womp womp. I don't actually know how to do that. Um, we're going to have to be in some ways potentially retrained in order to do a new thing. And so we're investing heavily in, in supporting and investing in our faculty for them to be able to continue to be part of this evolution with us. Over here, infrastructure is super important for us. Um, you know, over there, we're talking about investing in technology and facilities, as you're seeing some of the technology that we have been investing in over the years. Uh, we're also currently looking for a, another home for CMCB as well. Uh, over here, making sure that people know, externally promote CMCB's vision to reach new support. So that people know what CMCB is and what we're doing. All of you are a part of us being able to do that right now just by showing up, especially those of you who are having your first visit to CMCB. And then go for making sure that this is sustainable, uh, making sure that we're holding ourselves accountable as an institution, not only for what it is that we do, but how sustainable is it? CMCB is 113 years old, which is pretty cool because if it's last 113 years, I know I can't break it, uh, <laughs> which is very nice, but it's also an important responsibility as well when you're at an organization that is that has that type of longevity and you want to make sure that you're thinking specifically about about sustainability so about cmcb fy23 and beyond just to remind you uh you can click through these uh in 2017 cmcb was a pwi uh, it was that 
Um, and you can, you, as, a, as I said before, you can see it through every facet of the, of the organization. And to, since 2000, oh, those are out of order. <laughs> we had to put them all up. Since then, CMCB has really become uh, a leader in the conversations that are happening um, right now as it relates to arts education in particular. Now we have 43% BIPOC board members, 71% of our staff are self-identified as being BIPOC, uh, sorry, staff leadership, 71% of our staff and 43% of our faculty. That's only, that's been in five years, five years time. And to make a give that a finer point, that's been the growth over the course of the last five years. 150% on the board members, 400% on staff leadership, 140% BIPOC staff, 100% uh, BIPOC BIPOC faculty. So those are big numbers. Um, you know, uh, you know, and and actually. The, the, Something that was said to me once uh, by a friend, and she, she did a training here, her name was Liza Toulousen. She did a training and I share this, this fact a lot or this data point a lot. And I think it was, uh, I think it was the MIT, they did a study on diversity initiatives and, um, and they found that um, diverse uh, teams consistently outperformed homogenous teams, consistently homogenous teams were just happier about losing, <laughs> right? Um, and so these metrics and this kind of thinking, it's not about numbers, it's about actually being better. MIT, they don't know everything, Jim. <laughs> but, uh, but I would say that that's what this con that's what these types of evolutionary conversations are about. It's not about metrics. It's not about optics. It's about being really, really good or not as good. And so I think framing it from that perspective is actually very important because that allowed a board like this one to be able to say, moving beyond the status quo and moving us outside our comfort zone. And they knew that walking in the door, which I think is super dope. <laughs> on my, from my perspective. Oh, and alongside that, um, we're also back uh, after COVID. So as other places are trying to work their way back, our business model is more sustainable than it's ever been, as far as I know. Our community engagement programs, that's what CEP stands for. They're back. We just got a largest one that got the largest gift in history, $2.7 million gift from an anonymous donor as part of our capital campaign. I was just sharing with some folks earlier, CMCB is in the midst of a uh, capital campaign. We're currently raising, oh, was that a change? Uh, <laughs> we're currently raising uh, 15 million uh, as a capital campaign, which said this community is big. This community was thinking a lot, it was like maybe 3 million, maybe five, you know, let me, yeah. And now we're talking about a $15 million target of which we've already raised almost 10. And we've right. still got, what's that? <laughs> go for 20. Uh, Daniel said go for 20. Um, but again, you know, to, to, but that is, it's a proof of the point that this is not about optics. This is not about things that look pretty on posters. This is actually about an institution evolving to become something better than it's ever been maybe, you know? And to me, that is the, as we're thinking, as we engage in our conversation, that was the, uh, that was the frame that we walked into. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the scary moments uh, because it's not all, you know, ice cream and puppy dogs. Um, but we'll also talk about some of the times in which we had to like stand ourselves and root ourselves in our values and who we were as an institution and how we partner together to do that. So I'm gonna take just 30 seconds to get myself situated and thank you for listening to that part, which was actually perfect timing. Okay, uh, so thanks. Because, should I give questions to the folks do you think now? Actually, no, I'm gonna ask, please write down your questions. Nobody wants to. Did anyone have any questions from any of that? Yeah, please. Oh, uh, I'm gonna give you the mic. 
All right. Oh, it's not on, is it? I'll get you. I'll do it one day. So the people at home can hear you. Hi, thanks. I'm Patty Keenan. I work at Alice Early Learning just down the street. Yeah. And this is my first visit. Hi. I'm, hi, thank you. I'm very impressed by everything you shared. I have a question about your capital campaign. Is that an, an all-inclusive? Does that include like annual giving and other giving yep. throughout the year? Okay. That's right. Yep. And what's your time frame for raising the money? 25. Okay, 2025. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Daniel? Jack. So I'm curious about, you, you kind of alluded to this when you were talking about uh, PWI and what people thought of it, but I'm just curious, since you've been here and you've implemented this stuff, what has your, been your experience? Uh, has anyone expressed to you what people would call white fragility? <laughs> oh. Would, would you like yeah. to give us, give us some examples of that? Um, oh, that's deep. Um, what I would say is, yes, uh, if you're looking at the um, Robin D'Angelo definition for white fragility, sure, uh, definitely experienced uh, definitely experienced that. Um, I think that there were um, there were probably some things that, well, the things that were uh, were big, you know, I think that we can talk a little bit about as a group, but some of the more um, covert things um, was, um, something as simple as what do people watch on television, right? Um, and I would bring in and say, we're gonna talk about blackish, <laughs> right? Because that's what I'm watching and I'm the boss. So we're talking about blackish today, <laughs> right? And there was, some, there was some discomfort around that. I would say that would, so there were some things that were more covert. Were there some, uh, there were other things that I think um, some people thought I, I thought too much about race. Um, some people thought that, you know, it's a bit much. Can we tone it down a little bit? I'm like, it's only a bit much if you're not black. For me, this is just about enough, <laughs> right? This is the right amount. Um, and so there was this discomfort in having conversations about things like race. I shared with folks that I thought that um, color blindness was racist, right? Because it basically ignores everything about me that can't be framed in whiteness. I don't get to be black if you're colorblind. And I wanna be black sometimes, <laughs> right? And I wanna be culturally black. And so those were some, and people were, there was some discomfort with me being so culturally, I want to be able to say something is dope and something is whack. I want to be able to use African American vernacular English, and people still know that I'm smart, right? I can I should be able to use AAVE as much as I want to, and people still honor the fact that I know what the hell I'm doing. Um, so again, those were those are parts of me that are black, and that are culturally black, uh, and so there that was very difficult, and people had to. Uh, shift themselves and their recognition of what it looked like to be someone who was a leader and what a leader sounded like. And what were the things the leader said? And there was some fragility and we lost some people. We lost staff members. We lost board members. We did lose people. But I had people like these two who were like, do you, we got you. And it would not have worked without them at all. And there were moments in which they were nervous but they still had my back because they realized that I was the realization of their vision and all the other folks who were on that search committee as well. To pull out my notes, there you are. So I'm gonna introduce, uh, actually, do you mind introducing yourselves while I pull out my notes? Hello, everybody. Is this on? It is, it I is think on. you might have to go closer. Hello, everybody. Can you is give that us some good? Volume? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Brenda Ross, and I am currently a board member. Um, I served as the co-vice president for two terms, uh, which ended, I believe, in August. So it's lovely to be here, and I can't wait for us to engage in conversation. Hi, and uh, welcome. Is this on? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm Martin Thompson, and I was the uh, uh, board president up until last year. Uh, for four years. And prior to that, I was 
board vice president for four years. And in that capacity, I, I led the search committee that brought Lacolian to us, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> we always joke and say we were the proud parents of Lacolian because we were both on the selection yeah. committee along with some other people. Exactly. Um, so my first question for you to, um, we talked a little bit about this before, um, and I talked a little bit about it up there. This is, you know, how the, how that the uh, position announcement landed on me. Um, when you were in your conversations, and I know there's a lot of folks here who are going through leadership transitions right now. Um, so this is really probably a, a really helpful thing to board members who are experiencing that. I've talked to several here already. Um, what were you solving for as a board? I mean, in, in, in those conversations, what were you, what were you solving for? Well, I'll, I'll start. We uh, we had a uh, we undertook a strategic planning process um, two years before the the current executive director was leaving. Uh, it was a three year plan, and so the last year of that plan would be the first year for the new ED. We thought that would be the sort of generous approach to have the ED come into a to an existing strategic plan, um, and then you know carve his or her own way from there. We as a board, so we went through the strategic plan process and the uh, the consultant helping us with that just pointed out very early in the process that we were not as diverse as our as our students were. and uh, and I, that landed very heavily on on me and 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 certainly other other board members as well. Um, and we knew that we had to change and and the the time was right for that kind of change. And so for for me, we, you know, we, we needed to, the, the search had to be much more sort of broad reaching and pervasive than uh, than the previous, the, than we had been imagining up to that point. Um, and so we, we the current, the, uh, the board president at, at the time uh, and I got together and, and we, we, need, we knew we needed to not only we needed to bring together a very a div as diverse a search committee as we could, draw, drawing from the board, uh, and then hoping that 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 basically would just that would influence the process in such a way that that the entire experience would be one of diversity and, and inclusion. Yeah, I guess I would add to that. Um, I think at the very basic level, we were like, okay, we need to find an executive director. I don't know that we clearly knew what we were looking for. It was through conversation, um, not only with ourselves within the selection committee, but also with the candidates that it started to make sense for us what we were actually looking for. So it was a process that evolved over time. As a woman of color, I was so glad to be on the committee because I felt like wow, I'll make sure that we're getting some candidates of color in here and that we're thinking about it. So for me, that was really important because I thought if we look at our student uh, population and we look how diverse it is, we know representation matters. And these students were not seeing anyone that looked like them in the school beyond other students. And so that was really, really important to me. And so I kind of had a behind the scenes role, if you will, to make sure that we were doing the right thing. Yeah, and on my side, um, uh, when I looked at the, uh, when I got my first interview with the search committee and I looked out in, you know, there was a Zoom screen, and I look out and I see uh, all these, you know, a lot of white faces and then, you know, a brown face and an Asian face. I was like, oh, okay. Well, it's not all any one thing. It's mostly, but it's not all. And I would say that, you know, and, and I said this to you before, Brenda, seeing your face out there was very comforting, um, right? It really was. It actually was, as a candidate, it was very meaningful to me to see your face there. And seeing your face was really comforting <laughs> too, you know, because that doesn't always happen. So it was like, Oh, okay. We got we got some candidates of color. This is good. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to go on to my to my to my next question. Theoretically, uh, there it is. Oh, well, something has all happened with my phone, but oh, well, I, I know I have a sense of it. Um, so we went through that whole process, and I got here. Um, and when I arrived in 2017, of course, I didn't know anyone. 
When you were thinking about your role as a board member, um, Martin, initially your role as uh, board vice president, you know, in you know, be, you know, incoming president, um, and Brenda, your role as a board member. Um, what did you feel like your role was for me? And I will say this, not the role that you would have with any executive director, uh, which oftentimes gets misconstrued. Not only what was your role with any executive director, any new person coming in, but specifically as you're thinking about, we have a new executive director of color. What are some things that you felt like were um, important things to you as you thought about your role in being supportive? Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> we, I had uh, had a little bit of experience uh, bringing in uh, people from outside of Boston into Boston organizations, and it had never gone well. And the, the Boston is a tough, tough town. You know, it's a very, uh, it's a very it's insular community. Um, people are not very friendly. And, uh, and in particular, you know, it has a national reputation, frankly, as a per place that is not welcoming to people of color. And so- Racist? Well, now. <laughs> oh, sorry, we're not doing that? We're not saying that? Okay, no, go ahead, my bad, sorry. <laughs> and so I saw my role as, as being, uh, the, as, as not the guy who was gonna bring in an executive director from outside who was a person of color and not be, and, and let him hang. You know, I was not the guy who was gonna not give him a living wage, you know, not, uh, not provide the support that he needed and not be, you know, fully behind him. That's was my commitment to that. Um, I think there were a couple of things for me. I, I wanted us to think about this new person, the executive director, as we would any new executive director coming in. However, there was a caveat that I really wanted to make sure that our own personal biases, as well as some of the systemic and structural things that existed within the organization would not get in the way of this person being successful. So I thought, you know, we really need to be, this person really, we need to be not only thought partners and collaborators with this person, but we also need to protect this person to some degree to make sure that they are feeling supported, particularly as a person of color, um, that Lacolian, I guess, was feeling really supported, um, knowing that there are things in place that could make him very uncomfortable. Yeah, on, on my end, um, some of my, my hopes uh, for uh, the board was, you know, number one, that um, I would not be expected to assimilate uh, and become something differently than who I actually was, um, that there would not be any pushback or blowback uh, for me being authentically who I was. Um, I had been in places um, where uh, that was rejected um, and then I rejected them uh, in kind. Uh, and so and that was something that, you know, to be honest, I was, every time I said something was dope, I was like, I don't know how that's gonna play in this room, but, <laughs> You know, or say that it's like, well, I think that's just kind of whack, you know, and like I was like, I don't know if I'm going to have a job <laughs> if I continue on 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 this uh, on this course. But I also was um, committed to being authentically who I was, um, because what board members didn't see was I was in this building every day with our students um, and they deserve to see someone who was being authentically themselves who had gotten to a position like I was in. Uh, they, I didn't want them to feel like they had to assimilate in order for them to achieve a certain level of success. Um, that was, and I really thought a lot about our, a lot about our student population because it, I was a kid who wished he could have been part of an organization like CNCB. I didn't have resources like that. I didn't have access to a place like this. And so I felt like uh, a responsibility in many ways to the young people that I saw in the, in the building every day who came into my office to hang out, we play hide and seek in the lobby and the like, like that was, uh, that was something that was very important to, uh, to me. Yeah, and I can just jump in there. 
you know, the CMCB, the, the way I thought of CMCB, or, or and a, a lot of us did, was that it was a place where people, where kids really wanted to be here, and uh, and it was a family atmosphere, is a family atmosphere, and and we were taking a risk because we were bringing somebody in from outside we didn't really know who uh, we need, you know, we felt like that was important to the institution that it have that sense of a place where you really want to be, and a place where the ex former executive director remembered every kid's name. He remembered kids' names who had been here 30 years before. And so uh, that essence of the place um, was really, we handed that over to Lacolian, you know, in and hoping that he would under, you know, he would understand that and and slot himself into that role. And and he did. I mean, I watched, I watched he was as he would play with the kids. And uh, it just really uh, was heartwarming for me. And we and I knew almost immediately that we had made the right choice. The other thing I will say that, you know, because uh, we're talking about, you know, what were some things that the, the board needed to do in order for me to be successful? Um, when I first got here, there were a lot of people who started to leave, you know, for multiple reasons. Um, but that can be really scary for an organization when people are leaving, when a new leader comes in. Um, and that can, and, and oftentimes the board will say, well, wait a minute, something must be, something wrong must be happening if people are leaving. Um, we wanna go in another direction, but there might be something wrong if people are leaving. Um, and there were several moments in which uh, the board as a whole, and particularly Martin, I think, could have taken advantage of an opportunity to say, you know what? Maybe we should slow down a little bit. Um, and you know, credit to him as a board member, he didn't do that. Um, he trusted me enough to give me the space. I wasn't perfect, I made some mistakes. Of course, every new leader does, um, but I did not feel like, I didn't feel like someone was, um, was, was taking score. Um, I really felt like there was a, a group of people who had power at the time um, and a, a significant amount of power as it related to me and my ability to be successful. And it was, it, you know, Martin, you haven't shared this story, but there was actually a moment in which we were in a meeting and someone made a racist comment to me um, in a meeting, um, in, an, in an executive committee meeting. Um, and uh, that was a moment in which, you know, I had never experienced someone standing up really for me um, as, a, as a black man to say, now, wait a minute, like, that's not something that we tolerate. Um, and, you know, this is going, this is not going to be a moment in which we're going to call in. This is actually a moment which we're going to call out. Um, and Martin really stood up. And those of you who don't know Martin, that's way outside his temperament. That's way outside his comfort zone. And so I know that that was really a difficult moment for him, but he also had the courage to stand up. And I have always um, been proud uh, of that moment. Yeah, and we did lose a, a couple of board members, but it made sense. You know, it was, it was for the, it was a positive development for us. Um, and yeah. So my next question, you know, first it was about expectations of, you know, of you as a board member, uh, but now we'll pivot over to what were your expectations of me as a, as a new leader? What did you expect of this new leader that was coming in? And also, again, not only as a new leader, but specifically thinking about as a new leader of color who is going to be existing in some predominantly white spaces, and actually, probably some predominantly non-white spaces as well. What were some of your expectations, Brenda? Do you, you know, any expectations? Yeah, I, I really felt like at times we were going down a very radical path, and I thought, oh my goodness, where are we going? And we're trusting this this person to take us there. And so, um, I had to take a deep breath and know that our conversations. We met every week, and so. Um, nothing was ever a surprise. So I think it was those conversations that kept me feeling comfortable and feeling like, okay, this is right. He knows what he's doing. We're going down the right path. This is going to end up in a very good place. But I will say when all the change was happening and people were 
it was a little frightening, you know, and then I had to just, again, take a deep breath and say, you know, humans don't like change. And so we are going to lose some people. That's just inevitable, whether it's Lacolian or some other uh, executive director that we're talking to. So it really became through our conversations and um, just trusting in him uh, that he knew what he was doing, um, that I became really comfortable and, and I began to see the light even more. And, and for my part, going all the way back, you know, having made the, 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 having had the thought that we wanted somebody who in the position who wasn't a white male, and I would say that this is no reflection on a, the previous executive director who is a wonderful, wonderful guy, um, that, that I, I had no idea where, where we were going to end up. Absolutely none. And, 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 and I, I knew so little about what I didn't know. And, uh, and I, of course, that's still the case, but I've, I've learned so much more, so much more since, uh, since that, you know, in the last five years, um, it's been absolutely, uh, you know, transform transformative. Um, but, but I will say that I had no clue as to where we were going <laughs> and that was okay. <laughs> it just, it's worked out okay. We were in it together. <laughs> there you go, exactly. <laughs> and I have to tell you, my vocabulary has really expanded since Lacoli <laughs> has been here. Um, I went to all girl preps, white girls, uh, all high school. And so uh, some of the words he came in with were new to me, but <laughs> hey, it's dope now. Yeah. <laughs> that was so funny. Um, uh, I, I said that, you know, we had a former board member. He came up to me. He was like, so Lacoli, I just realized dope means good. I was like, yes, yes, it does. Um, on, on my side, um, so there, there was two things. Um, I would say the first thing on my side, and, and that's why I always felt like, uh, the collaboration between, uh, myself and the, and the board was really strong because on my side, I understood that it was my part of my job to be able to name what we were doing in a way that people could understand. So it was my it was my responsibility to be able to do as good a job as I could to just be able to say this is what we're doing this is why this is important this is where we're going this is why this is not only logical you know um, but it's also the moral thing and it's also the best this makes financially good sense like the world is moving so we were having that conversation in 2017 and it took a while for people to understand that but I just kind of kept hammering it home. But it also took, um, there's this guy named Paul Gorski. Um, he wrote um, a, a white paper on the concept of the pace of change versus the pace of privilege. Um, and uh, I, I uh, the board had to, I didn't put it up here, but we talk about blind spots all the time. Oftentimes privilege creates blind spots. So there's some things that folks in privilege just can't see. Uh, and so they have to actually oftentimes trust that when we're moving in your blind spot, that we're moving correctly in your blind spot, you just can't see it yet. And so if we wanted to move at the pace of privilege, we would have had to wait until everyone understood and then moved. Uh, and institutionally, we decided, and as a partnership, we decided we're going to move at the pace of change rather than the pace of privilege. Uh, and so there were some things that board members have to agree with, and they were like, I don't know if this is the right thing, but I'm going to have to trust a little bit that this is the right thing to do. Um, and it was, and when George Floyd happened, so many board members, I could see them going, oh. So when the world was starting to say, wow, this is what happens in the world, like we had already been moving in a direction in which that was uh, which we had a way to respond to that. We were already trying to respond to that institutionally. Again, because we were already moving at this pace of change. So when we were watching other places scramble and talk about and give these performative statements, our board was like, wait, we got some receipts. We started in 2017. We're not starting in 2020. And so that has given us a little bit of a leg up as we're thinking about what we're doing and where we're going. That's where that change comes from. That change doesn't happen in two years or three years, right? I mean, it, it takes real time and uh, it really took a board that was comfortable not moving at the pace of privilege. 
Uh, because again, that typically is the greatest barrier to progress, uh, is, is the, the dissonance between the pace of change and the pace of privilege. And we did lose, I forget, like four or five different uh, board members um, mm -hmm. as we were going through the process. So yeah. the numbers were going down and we were like, ooh, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> but um, clearly uh, we have um, changed that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But again, it was again, it's it does it does take a certain amount of trust. Uh, I have one more I have one more question for you all. Um, I wrote here. Um, now we're uh, we've gone through these years of you know it's, it's a big ship for us you know and trying to get the thing to turn is hard it takes time but now I, I think that we all can agree we we're, we're we've turned uh, the institution is a different organization um, so uh, what do you think in the organization like CMCB on the board side what does the board need to do moving forward uh, to continue uh, now that we're moving in a direction to kind of get the momentum moving even stronger uh, toward, towards our destination. Before we go there, I just want to add to that. Let's add that layer of, and by the way, there was a pandemic that happened, <laughs> right, when all of this was going on. So, you know, kudos to you and your team for navigating all of the change of just going in a different direction as well as a, as a pandemic. And so. to, and you know, to that point, everyone, the board members know this. The when we closed on March thirteenth, Friday the thirteenth, that everyone knows about, um, we the the first thing I thought was okay. So we don't know. We don't know if the, we don't know if BPS is going to pull all of our contracts and say, hey, you know, no teaching in schools, no money. Um, we don't know if all of our parents are going to leave, and we're not going to have any, you know, you know, no more earned revenue coming in. And so we were pretty, you know, terrified. What we called a special meeting of the board um, uh, to, uh, I asked the board to approve a draw from our reserve uh, to ensure that we could pay everyone for the rest of the fiscal year. So we could just kind of figure some things out. And I was like, I don't know if we're gonna need it, but if I do need it, I'm gonna need it quickly. And I'm not gonna have time to come to you all and get, in, you know, to get an approval. So I need you to just approve it now. And trust me, I won't use it if I don't need it, um, and there was it was it was really quick. And so when I uh, uh, um, feeling that um, the when the board the board made that call uh, on a Sunday, so when I met with our staff on Monday morning, that was the message I was able to give every one of them. And I was like, okay, now everyone go and share with our faculty that they're okay, at least with us. And so they were getting concerts canceled everywhere. Other places were saying, you're not teaching, we're not paying you. And CMCB came in and we were like, well, we're, you know, we are a community um, and we're going to do our part. And so uh, uh, I was, that moment was, uh, from that moment, to be honest, I worked my, I was, oof, I'm going to my phone. I was committed to working my tail off for this institution and for this board uh, and for this community because it was, it was, it was a team. Uh, and everyone was everyone was putting putting their their money where their mouth was and putting skin in the game to ensure that this thing was still sustainable. So I will uh, I'm rubber, you're glue. <laughs> Whatever you say, bounce off me and stick to you. Um, you know, because again, it was it did take the entire community to uh, to rally to make that thing work. And I think we were in the middle of the strategic planning process <laughs> when it happened, and the question was, do we continue? With, with the strategic planning process, and and we did. And it was the, the right move, because then we were in a position, once things started to open up, uh, to to begin to build on on what we had, uh, on what we were gonna be delivering. Yeah. So before I open up to questions from, from the audience, um, I'll just share, uh, um, one, one, one last, one last thing. When I got the job here at CMCB, there's a big gala right above us in the cyclorama. Um, and uh, it was really celebrating uh, my predecessor, David Lappin, celebrating his departure. Uh, and then I was also um, uh, asked to you know, say a few words as well as the incoming executive director. I remember when they called my name, it's hundreds of people out in the audience. I introduced you. You did. <laughs> 
when Martin introduced me <laughs> as the incoming executive director, um, I remember walking up there and people were just applauding, like no, they were throwing babies in the air. People were just like, so, you know, oh, here he is, you know? And I, as I was walking up there, I was like, well, what is this? And I was like, I remember getting up there and saying, sit down. Like, no, don't, I haven't done anything yet. Like, make me earn it. Uh, so, you know, no, I thank you, thank you, thank you, but make me earn it. Um, you know, and I, um, and now as I think back on that, um, I wasn't, uh, I don't think I was totally clear in the, in that moment, but, um, if I look at what has happened over the course of the last few years, um, as an institution, we all earned it. So that applause we got at our last gala, uh, we all earned that because again, there were some things that uh, I wanted to do <laughs> that people were like, uh, wait a minute, let's think through that. And I had to have enough humility to be able to say, you know what, maybe that's not the, maybe that's not the right call. Um, there were some things I had to press through and there were some things I had to have the humility to be able to say, maybe that's not it. And the board members had to say, these are some things, but these are some, and, but you know, these are some things that I think we should be doing. And sometimes that was my charge to do some of those things, but the board also had to step back and say, you know what, I don't know about, I don't know about this, but we're going to have to have enough humility to, to back off because there's a chance you may be moving in one of our blind spots. Um, and again, you know, the the institution was very much a partnership, I think, uh, throughout this entire process. And, you know, people always say that the proof is in the pudding and the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we have really evolved and grown a, as an institution and we're continuing that process. So, and so for us to, to sustain this type of momentum, I think we have to continue to be very agile as an institution. Um, because if we don't, then we start putting old wine in new bottles. You know, we start rewrapping the same present. The idea is not to get to a place to say, oh, we're good, we did it now, right? Because then we just become like the thing that we were evolving away from. What we wanna do, and I think in most organizations that are thinking about what type of uh, culture to create, it's actually a culture that welcomes the concept of change um, because, you know, again, the only constant is change. Um, and to be honest, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse, uh, right? There is no sustaining. As a musician, I know that, uh, right? As a musician, if I was just practicing to maintain where I was, I was getting worse somewhere, uh, <laughs> right? It was just a place I wasn't looking at. Um, and so again, I think institutionally, that's also, uh, something that will allow us to continue to sustain uh, the momentum that I think we have, we've gained right now. So we wanna open it up to some questions. I'm sure someone will monitor the chat uh, as well. Uh, so we wanna open up to some questions uh, from any of you, whether it's for uh, on the management side, understanding how the organization did those things or on the governance side, if you're a board member and you have questions about how did this board um, think about this work? How did this board become a greater support? How did this board navigate a search process in a way that was that was effective for the group um, and effective for the vision? Uh, any questions? Uh, I'm gonna borrow, I'm, actually you two might share a mic and I'm gonna borrow a mic and I'll be the person who does this. Who is this? Uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, this is, to say this is impressive and admiring is an understatement. <laughs> so, what words of advice would you have for other organizations that are negotiating and navigating the world today? You are uh, the picture of success. Um, I heard you say that not everything worked out and there were some problems along the way. Um, what do we need to know about as we negotiate and navigate? So the first thing, I think it's on. Oh, I think it might be blinking. Is it blinking? Oh, we we'll see. Check, check, check. Yep. Yeah. The other one, this happens every. Uh, okay. Can you give that to Joy? Thanks. Um, so the now I lost my train of thought. Okay, wait a minute. 
the, so the first thing I would say is be really clear about what it is that you want, like the direction you're thinking about going in and really define for yourselves what that looks like, right? So that you are very intentional about um, the kind of person that you uh, would want to be in that role. And so one of the things we didn't have a, we didn't talk about, but um, we did in our selection process was we realized we needed to be really intentional about talking about DEI issues, talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and asking our candidates to really share with us their kind of ideology and philosophy around that. And so that was an area where we knew we wanted to make sure that that person had a strength, as an example, that that was an area of um, that they were focused on as we were focusing on those things as well. So that clarity up front of where do you want to go and why are you going there would be my first suggestion. And as somebody in my demographic, <clears throat> uh, I, I would suggest that you really listen with, with a lot of ears open. To, to the change that that uh, y that you never expected. I mean, I had, you know, as I said, I, I was comp I had no idea of where we were co going with this, but uh, but being but I was I think I I'd like to think that I was I was open to it and I was listening and uh, and I heard you know and, and I heard so I would say be attentive and listen to what's going on. I'd like to respond to that as a, just as a candidate. I've got my oh, okay. yeah I've got a. Um, just as a, as a candidate, um, uh, th these folks, they were asking the questions that I, I was hoping they would ask. Um, I mean, they were, they were, at, they wouldn't, they didn't go down the list of the top 10 questions you ask in an interview. They were really asking me a lot about my philosophy on change. And they were asking me about, um, what were some of the things that I was solving for? I remember when we met for dinner, um, that first night. Um, I just remember all these questions that I was getting. I was like, these are not the questions that you typically ask at an interview. What are your greatest strengths and weaknesses? You know, and that sort of thing. And you take, make your strengths sound like, a, you know, whatever. Um, you know, they were not asking the, uh, the traditional questions. They were really trying to find a partner. And so they were asking me the questions that you would ask someone that you wanted to partner with. So it's not just their skill set. It's really more about what do you believe in? Um, because that's who that's what we're partnering with. And that was I for me, that was something that I thought was really special. Um, having been through many interviews before at that time as a college professor when I was doing that, having been through many of them, um, having people ask me about my beliefs um, and what were the changes I wanted to make and what was my vision for the future and that sort of thing. Like that was and that was the centerpiece of the conversation. Um, was centered, it was centered around that. And even though I might have had some skill set gaps, I'd never run an organization of this size before. I, you know, hadn't worked with an organization, had an endowment. Um, you know, I had cultivated a certain skill set that folks could, that I could speak to and that folks uh, listen to. Um, but I would say that to me, the values conversation um, was, was big. Uh, and it was the centerpiece of uh, of of the entire interview process for me. Could we do a question from the chat online? Yes. Yeah. And then back over there. Yeah. So um Dara asked, I'm curious how the board got to the place they were at prior to hiring Lacolian. Um, were there just progressive members who pushed things forward? Uh, you mentioned some folks left. So how did they get past conflicts within the board about the organization's direction? Um, I, I think that what happened was that, uh, as I said, we were, myself and, and, and my predecessor as president were, uh, and also Barbara Roberts, who's also here, our previous <laughs> president as well. <laughs> I guess we just never leave, you know, the officers <laughs> of this organization just stick around forever. So we had a long conversation about who, who should be on the search committee. And, and we, as I said, we wanted it to be diverse and reflective of, you know, the sort of different viewpoints on the, on the board. And I, I think as a result of that, that the, the seven of us, I think it was, um, you know, did kind of steer the boat in terms of uh, who, who we wanted. And, and, uh, and, and I think that we sort of, you know, the board took our suggestion 
and uh, and 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 uh, I think and became comfortable with it. Although, as you know, there were folks on the board who you know had had other other questions, and uh, and I but at that point we were already, mm -hmm. you know, we had already bought into our candidate, and we were supportive of him, you know, sort of right off the bat. Yeah, you should put that there. Yeah. Jim, who was a, a Jim Pyatt, who was also a board member uh, at the time. Yeah, yeah, and I wasn't involved on the on the committee, but the conversation just about diversity to begin had been in the air to, to direct to the question from the chat for years. It appeared on at least two or three strategic plans that I was party to or involved in retreats over the years. And with no disrespect at all to the intentions or the capabilities of you know the former administration or whatever, I, th I think to uh, quote Lacolian, if you want to get more black people in the room, you've got to go to a black church. <laughs> That's and, not what I said. Um, something to that effect. <laughs> My point being, yeah. we didn't know how to do it, right. and we didn't know how to be direct about it and blunt to get to the objective. Actually, I, I will I will say that, yes, I, I, there's two things I said. That's, that's actually a, a blending of the two. <laughs> uh, one of them is you're not going to, um, you're not gonna find your amazing black candidate at your lovely white church, um, right? Like they're, they're just not there. Uh, so if that is where you're going and where you're, what you think about, because you know, it's black people in Boston, I live around them. I live in Roxbury, right? So like, I, I know it's black people here, um, right? But, and so people act like they're like a mystery to find. Uh, <laughs> they really are not. So that's, that's one. Um, and um, uh, the other thing that I say is, and this is what I say to most people, um, you know, most white people who I know, Every one of them has a black friend. You know, every one of you has four or five black people that you invite to your party so your party isn't too white, right? And so, you know, always so you have, you know, two or three people of color that you put on the guest list, you know, so that the party is not an all white party. And what I told our board was introduce me to those people, <laughs> right? Like this is, this, these things are checkers. They're, it's not chess, right? <laughs> I mean, it's actually much more simple. Than people think that it is. Um, and so I think that to Jim's point, I tried to be very authentically, honestly, and, and blunt, because again, to make it simple, it's is simple. So if you're saying, oh, we really like to recruit some black people, re really like to, and I speak from a black perspective. So I know that there are other, there are other identities in the world. I just speak from my own, uh, from my own identity, my own perspective. But you know, it's like, you really want to meet some black people. It's like, you know, we do stuff. We go places, go to Daryl's. Like, you know, we, you know, <laughs> there are black people around, around town. And so I just think that um, there had been this disconnect. It had become this kind of um, amorphous type of thing that had no solution, no simple solution. And again, um, uh, it was, it ended up being more, more checkers than chess. Uh, there was a question here and then, uh, and, no, and then, been no, she, yeah, she's been waiting. Yeah, no, you, you have the mic. Yeah. 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 Okay, yes, you can hear me. Um, so what can you all share with us, both as former board members and as the, the ED, the leader, about the kind of conditions or what, what a board can do to set the conditions for a BIPOC leader specifically to have durability, to have longevity? And in what ways did the search consultant help you all think about that from the outset? So one of the things that we did uh, was we formed a committee, uh, a DEI committee, and, and um, Lacolian showed you uh, the value statement that we came up with. And so we started to infiltrate, I guess is the word I'll <laughs> use, that into the board about what was important, what we were saying we valued as an organization. So we started to, uh, I would say we started to open up the conversation because I don't think that there really was a lot of conversation that was as direct in the past. So really starting to just kind of educate and advocate and talk about it in a very open way um, so that, you know, when a person came on board, this wasn't new, this wasn't new language that they were hearing. So the, I think the committee helped to start uh, the engagement and the work. 
Yeah, maybe that it, it seemed it worked out well for us that that in Lacolian's second year we we went through a strategic planning process, and that I think that so, so you know he had the the sort of comfort of an existing strategic plan in place when he got here, and, and then uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, uh, but then and then he could it, you know and then we initiated a plan with him here. Uh, and and that's when those conversations really became aired, and where the values of the organization came into play in terms of developing, you know, a five-year plan for the organization. So I think it would it worked well for us uh, as a, as a point of departure and and progress. Just one other thought. One other thought to share. Uh, one of the assets of the board has been, I think, uh, they're a fairly well-knit, tight group, and so there were very strong relationships that we could leverage um, to bring people together, and so I think having that as a board that was kind of already in unison in many ways helped as well. And and I agree uh, that with you, that you hit the nail on the head. Um, the board and there might have been individual members who might not have been um, fully behind the direction, but the board wasn't fractured. Uh, and oftentimes you'll walk into, and I have leaders around the country who've experienced that they've walked into organizations where the board was in a fight and that they got in the middle of when they showed up, when they walked in the door. And it's like, oh, well, I didn't realize you all were fighting. Right, because I was dealing with a group of people who agreed to hire me. Uh, <laughs> then I left that group and came into the rest of the body, and I realized that maybe that group didn't represent the will of the body. Um, and so that that so that can be a, a huge challenge um, uh, for a new leader. But this board, I didn't deal with that fracturing. Um, it was really actually to your point, it was a board that was much more unified in the direction, and I felt that. Um, and so I felt that I was really having a conversation with one group, not four. Uh, and I wasn't trying to get, you know, two of them to come together. So, you know, I wasn't feeling like it was Congress where I was trying to get, you know, right? <laughs> trying to get people to come together. Um, you know, you know that, that wasn't uh, the situation that I had. And so that was, it's a wonderful question and I appreciate it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was th that lack of fracturing on the board side actually made my job a lot easier. Um, and so I would, I, would, I would definitely say that. Uh, I think Jarrell, yeah. yeah. We do also, we'll have a, one from the uh, chat next. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having this. My name is Jarrell Cox. I'm the CEO of United South and Settlements. So an incredible panel. Thank you for all your good work in the community. My question is around a lot of boards are trying to get representation. So I was really happy to see that your numbers are rising on more BIPOC candidates on your board. I'm curious about, um, to, to the question about longevity and sustainability, I'm finding that getting more representation on my board, it's first of all, it's difficult, but when they get on there, they don't actually feel comfortable mm -hmm. and they don't feel connected and they don't feel welcome. So I'm really curious, about the work that you're doing as a board to invest in the people who are already on the board and developing these pipelines and then creating inclusion and making sure that people feel safe, that their voices feel heard, that that blackness is being, really being in, brought and in, folded into the culture of the board. Well, I can say a little bit, but you go ahead. You know, it's it's not all peaches and cream. Is, is that a <laughs> is that a term we're comfortable with? <laughs> yeah, that was dope. That was dope. Yeah, that was dope. Yeah. You know, at, and frankly, at our at our last uh, 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 board retreat, you know, there were I don't know eight, seven or eight people absent, and virtually all of them were people of color. So I don't think we are there yet that everyone is feeling as connected, that all of those folks are feeling as connected as some of the others on that board. So this is a little bit of, I mean, you know, we don't shy away from from a little bit of a downside. So uh, we're still working on it, you know, and, and I, I think that we can get there, you know, because we have, it's, it's always been a place where people feel at home. Uh, and I think that uh, hopefully that that will be uh, welcome. We'll be able to make ourselves welcoming to 
to BIPOC folks uh, on the board as well. But I, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, we we talked about this quite a bit um, uh, after that. Actually, um, you know, my 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 thinking is typically uh, uh, more radical. I think, as a general rule, um, uh, so there, there's there's two things. You know, in in classical music right now, there are a lot of these diversity initiatives, trying to get more people of color into classical music, specifically as it typically as it relates to symphony orchestra. Um, and the thinking about the metric is off because it 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 views the people who aren't there as the problem to be solved for. Um, right. So it's like, how do we get more people in? So let's figure out how we fix these folks so they can get into our thing. Um, right. Um, and that positioning is is um, is very much views individuals who aren't there as a deficit. Right. So we got to solve for this group. Um, what is not always discussed in that particular metric is how many people have gotten in left uh right like that's not because the metrics come from snapshots right so they're like today there were this many 10 years ago there were this many 20 years ago there were this many um and so um i would say uh, there's two things there's a, oftentimes a cultural thing where we don't talk about we talk about the people who aren't there but we don't talk about the people who have been repelled and we don't talk about the people who've been expelled uh, from some of these institutions. Like that's a group that's not discussed because um, then that then names the institution as the problem to be solved for, which I think is where Martin, uh, his frame was as well. It's like, actually, if people aren't doing the thing, we're the problem. Uh, there are some things that we can solve for. Now, every you know on the board, everyone has a commitment to showing up. And if you join a board, you're supposed to go to the things, the board, I get that. Um, but I would also say at that particular retreat, the people who were there knew each other. The most of the people who went, they actually knew they were connected. They were in community with people who were there. So they were coming to be part of a community that they felt like they were part of. And then there were other folks, many of the people who weren't there, you know, some people had kids who had things on Saturday morning, blah, blah, blah. But then there were some who were like, actually, they haven't been in, in the community. They haven't been part of the community. And it's actually the community's responsibility to do that. It's not on the other person to just jump, right? <laughs> It's on the community to say, you don't have to jump, I got you, right? And so there, there, are, there are two parts of that. I think that both are true, right? We talk about competing truths at CMCB all the time. There is a truth that, hey, if you volunteer to be on a board and you know, do that, you're supposed to show up to the thing. But then the other side has a responsibility too to say, if people have made the first step because they jump by joining, then we have to do the rest once they're here. So we have a commitment as a community, as an, as an institution, to ensure that people feel like they're part of this community as well. We don't just say that the folks who aren't here are the problem to be solved for. Yeah, so uh, we're coming up on eight o'clock. So I think we'll we'll probably close out oh. um, with a with oh, a pair of questions, um, uh, which I would I would say, and this is my editorial comment, are, are both inspired by the ways in which a lot of arts organizations can tend to try to seek out the bare minimum to look good rather than to uh, thoughtfully and successfully achieve meaningful change. The first question from Anita uh, is, can you talk a bit about how the board and staff leadership avoided elements pointing to the tokenization of people of color on the staff and board, particularly during a period where the organization remained so starkly uh, predominantly white, a PWI? And then the other from Samuel is, um, how would you advise a board of directors that quote unquote says they want change, but then continuously hamstrings or undermines the organization's executive director by being insistent on maintaining an unsustainable model? Not it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's do those. Let's do that. We'll do them one at a time. Can you just read the first one? Uh, read the first one again. So how did you avoid tokenization or seeking out the, the sort of bare minimum and not making people feel like another or an outsider, especially during a predominantly white phase? And then what would you advise to any organization that is um, saying they want change, but not actually making good on it or insisting on something unsustainable? I'll start. I, I think I've already said this, but I'll say it again. It our, our goals to move towards a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment started with what are our values. Um, and so I think you have to really work on putting those down, documenting, ingraining them in the conversation with folks so that people become 
um, people become more clear that you're serious about it, right? It's not just about getting brown and black black uh, bodies into the room. And so those are those are kind of words to live by. And so that's where I would start to continue to have the conversation and it has to be open conversation. It's not just a mural that goes up on the wall. You're living and breathing those words and challenging each other when you're not living and breathing um, those values, right? So that's where I would start. <laughs> that's a good start. I'm not quite sure how much to add. I, it did it did make me remember something, uh, which was that um, we wrote that position announcement, uh, and you know, you know, you can talk about wanting to change uh, a lot and and not. But but I we were so fortunate that we found a candidate who actually believed that we were serious, and that was that was the really that was the earth shattering thing was that <laughs> he actually took us at our word and then sort of held it held us to the word, um, and, and which is and that that fact is you know is phenomenal. And before you answer, Lacroix, in that the author of one of the questions it just issued a clarification, which is Im important, which is um, uh, how do you avoid making the few people of color in the room uh, made to feel like they're speaking on behalf of all people of color or all people who look like them? So uh, in other words, when there are only a few people of color on the board, how do we avoid making them do all of the things related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, for example? Well, the first thing, yeah. The first thing would be when you're talking about other people of color or you're talking about something that you think is culturally significant for them, don't look at them. <laughs> that, that would be the first thing. Don't all eyes go to that person. That would be a start. No, that's just a joke. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, as you've experienced that, I'm sure. Yeah. Haven't we all? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, again, it's around building the culture, right? You have to build the environment in which people begin to feel comfortable to be in conversation with each other. Wh whenever there are two people in the room, no matter what are, they are, there's potentially gonna be conflict. And sometimes conversations are gonna be uncomfortable, but that's okay. You have to create that culture that tells people, it's okay for us to be in this discomfort for the moment so that we can get to a better understanding. And my 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 response to that is that there is, and I know you had a comment as well, Sandra. Um, uh, Sandra. Okay, good. Well, my sister's name is Sandra. That's why. <laughs> um, but um, you know, my my comment on 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 the tokenism thing, I think that um, uh, you know, tokenism typically is um, happens when a place is trying to race to the bottom. Uh, right. So it's like, what's the least amount of y'all I got to deal with in order for me to not be bothered, not end up on the news? Like, what's the it's, it's basically a seeking of a minimum minimum standard rather than seeking for a liberatory standard. Um, so that is how that happens. But what I would say is, to be honest, um, tokenism does happen in the beginning. Every organization has a tokenistic period of its evolution. The question is, how long is it there? Uh, does that is that where the place stays for a decade? Because that's where you stay for a decade. Well, now you have moved from being, um, a, you know, a um, uh, an exclusive institution to an exclusive institution that also tokenizes people. So you've actually gotten worse, uh, right? To be honest, if you stay there for too long. Right. And so you're really trying to everyone recognize, you know, I recognize if, you know, everyone is like, oh, the first black man, first black woman, first Asian person. Right. Like those are things that happen. And that person then gets placed on the pedestal of being the first. Um, right. And so they end up to your point of speaking for and speaking for the group that does happen. It's a terrible, you know, uh, societal thing, but it does happen. But so I think I think the question is, how long does an institution stay in that space? Uh, if they stay that space for a long time, then again, that uh, the institution that was trying to get better just actually got worse. Um, and so I think that that is a thing. And to the point about uh, which I, I heard this point, but how do you how do you manage that? Um, this is where you start getting a lot more into the uh, into how power works, because the truth is those people in power 
are the ones who control what happens. They control the culture, they control the programmatic work, they control everything. And so if the people in power want that thing to stay, it's staying. That is just the way that it is, as the way that the thing, and whatever, however power is defined, whether it's by money, position, relationships, or whatever, right, like that is a real thing. And so I would say that if you're in an institution in which that power structure is saying that the, the power structure wants that thing to remain the way that it is, the amount of time it would take for that group to move is astronomical. And once they decide to move, they're 10 years away from progress, right? And so like to me in, in, the, in those moments, for me, it might be asking yourself, how long is it, how long is long enough for me? If you're the type of person who's like, I'm committed to this place for the next 15 to 20 years, well, then that particular evolution is on your timeline. But if you're like, I kind of want to, I kind of want to get there in the next decade or so, if you're looking at a place where the power structure doesn't want to, doesn't actually want to move, then the chances are slim that you're going to get there in that timeline. So it's not about whether or not, it's how fast, uh, right? Because both of them can move but one is gonna be able to move and evolve much more quickly than, than the other. Uh, Sandra? Thank you. So I have two questions, but because of time, you're welcome to choose the one you answer, right? So uh, one question is around values versus mission. I wanted to hear your um, experience around how you navigated the, the subtle differences between what are our values and what is our mission. Because oftentimes they're not necessarily integrated or harmonized. So mm -hmm. that's that's one. Um, the other one is around uh, stamina, right? Uh, because locally, and I don't disagree with you that people who are, whether they're the face of the work or the conscience of the work or the voice of the work, um, they often have to make a choice about, you know, do I can I can I play the long game? right? Because you have to meet them where they're at because you they're not, they can't meet you where you're at, right? <laughs> so part of it is um, the question is how did you um, stop the exhaustion, right? And, you know, the overused term is change fatigue. I don't mean that. Uh, it's not, it's stretch fatigue, Right. And so how did you manage just the exhaustion that comes with the kind of rawness um, that is just that happens when you're building new muscles? So for me, that's fairly simple. I would say I, I always focus on the prize and the prize were these beautiful human beings, young human beings that are running through the hallways here um, that deserve our best. And so that's the thing that energizes me as I, you know, even I'm thinking about my own work environment. It's the students, it's the, the thing that I wanna support that I'm there for in the beginning um, that keeps me, keeps me playing the game. I got one. No, you take the mic. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what she said. See, the one one of the things, <laughs> one of the great things about this whole process for me has been working with Brenda, who is, as you can probably tell, is just really brilliant. So, <laughs> so it's <laughs> it's been a, a real pleasure. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's watching, uh, for me, as being who I am, it's been watching the, all the good that comes out, has been coming out of this. It's just so rewarding to me, you know, to, to be a part of this process. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Um, you have been in clearly in multiple institutions that have tried or been around multiple institutions that have tried to do this work. And maybe some of them have done it really well um, because the fatigue really does set in i could see that um uh and you know that could be a component of um you know of you know maybe some of the people that have even left cncd um have been through some version of you know to reuse an overused term change fatigue um and that's even more relevant right now where where people are just tired in general 
uh, have not, having nothing to do with change fatigue, anything to do with their organizations. It's just what's happening in the world and what people have been through. The uh, the the mental strain has been has been significant. Um, one of the things that I think of in that is, um, you know, there was this woman. Uh, I was at an Americans for the Arts conference here, and I'll keep this short. Um, and there was a woman who they they put out this uh, diversity statement. It was in 2016, and people at the conference were really angry about the statement they put out because it was kind of a statement that didn't. They people felt like, from what I heard, I wasn't super involved, but people said it was a statement that didn't say anything. Um, but it was a statement. They made a statement nonetheless. Um, and there was a woman uh, who, and I never forgot it. I don't, I don't know her name, but there was they were they were like, hey, this was the best. We just want to make sure we got something. We want to be part of the conversation. Um, you know, and change uh, change takes a lot of time. And this black woman stood up and she said, I've been waiting my whole life for change. Who's speaking for me? Uh, who, who are we talking about? And I never forgot that, that, you know, that yes, there, it, there is some fatigue that comes from some, but there are some who are energized by that same thing. Because like finally somebody somewhere sees what I'm talking about and just, is just as passionate about that thing as I am. Um, and it's not necessarily just you know people of color. There are white people I know of who too who are like, oh my gosh, it's finally happening. I'm energized by this. So the, to me, it's more trying to marry those folks with the right places for them. Uh, so each place is going to be moving at a different pace, and each person is partnered with a place that's moving at their pace. Um, and so to me, it's not so much about a deficit in that. It's more just trying to find the right people to be in the right places at the right time. And, you know, speaking of staff members right now, they're so young. We have so many young ones here. Uh, they move. We know that they move very often anyway, regardless of what pace you're moving. Uh, <laughs> right. And so which is which is good. It's a, it's a positive thing. And that's probably the group that's going to move this conversation much farther, much more quickly. They're going to accomplish things that we never could. Right. Because they they get in it. They get into those things for. Uh, for 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 different reasons. So that would be my response to that. Would be that it's a real thing, um, and there is this opportunity to marry the right pace with the right people. All right. Well, I want to thank you all. Kudos to Martin and Brenda. Uh, I'll stand up. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I'm sure we'll be around to chat with you all. Uh, again, you know, uh, you're here because you're part of this conversation in your own organizations as well. And just hope you, you know, CMCB is in, in those conversations with you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice night. Get home safely. Thank you for everyone who showed up online. Thank you so much.